Why, hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, the Padres win another series over the lousy Pittsburgh Pirates. They made it a little bit scary, not going to lie. Thanks to, of course, we get some walk-offs from Trent Grisham, not who you expected, and Mackenzie Gore looking like the front runner for the, the National League Rookie of the Year Award. All that and more, guys. You know what you're listening to. Let's get started. You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Monday, May 30th. Happy Memorial Day to all of you fine, fine and lovely and joyful listeners. I hope you're having a great holiday or had a great holiday weekend, whatever it is you do. Hope you're enjoying. As always, I'm your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most. Javier Reyes. You might be familiar with some of my baseball related work at places like, you know, Just Baseball. That's the main one. Fires on Base, Off Bench Baseball, Baseball FYI, all sorts of places. But check me out at justbaseball.com for all of my regular baseball sort of stuff, including Padre stuff, which I'm planning on doing this week. But anyway, enough chitter chatter. Let me just also, one more thing I forgot to mention, guys. Go check out Bet Online. That is what today's episode is. They got us today, man. Starts, go check that out. Happy Memorial Day, like I said, everybody. And what better way for all the to win over the Pittsburgh Pirates, but not only in walk-off fashion. That's right. It was a weekend of ups and downs. You know, this was definitely what last week with the San Francisco Giants. That was a that was a series. As far as I'm concerned, you sweep the Giants, one of the better teams. They won 107 last year. They were amazing. And I still think personally going to be a pretty good team. I know they look a little bit meh right now, but I still think they're going to be pretty good. You sweep them. And then you come into this series against a team that has some of the worst starting pitching in all of baseball. They actually talked about it on Friday's broadcast saying like among National League ranks, basically 15th. Like they're pretty, pretty bad. And especially compared to the rest of the league, I imagine they're kind of in the bottom tier as well. Uh, so for the Padres to come out this weekend and essentially not have the greatest offensive performance uh, in the world is a little, I don't want to say startling because I think we've known that the, the weakness of this team is going to be its offense. But it is just a reminder that last weekend was what the Padres look at like, like when they're at their best. And this weekend is what they could potentially look like a lot as well when they're at their worst, which is a team that struggles to put up extra base hits when you need it, struggles to drive in runs, struggles to hit the long ball for sure. And a team that when they don't have Manny Machado and obviously not Fernando Tatis Jr. in the lineup, and heck, even Will Myers in the lineup, Oh, man, it's tough. It's tough getting those hits that you really need, man. It's tough scoring runs. But uh, let's first talk about uh, some of the good stuff, and let's first talk about yesterday's game that featured the walk-off. But first, before we get into that, we got to talk about Mackenzie Gore, man. I mean, we always have to talk about Mackenzie Gore. I mean, he's just been ecstatic. Now with a 1.71 ERA after this outing, uh, I, I mean, and by the way, the Padres won 4-2. I should probably say that first. Uh, I mean. I just, he's been incredible. He's been incredible. 1.07 whip on the year as well uh, for all my whip heads uh, in this game. Seven innings, zero earned runs, only two hits allowed. Did issue three walks, but struck out nine over 93 pitches. I, I joked about it. I plugged my own tweet last week, which I probably am going to, I'm going to make it a bit to keep resharing during this to Madam Zeroni from Holes, where if the Padres didn't do, the right thing, uh, which was, you know, keeping him, that they would have been cursed. And Gore is a good example of what, how quickly things can fluctuate in baseball, sports in general, and life in general. But it's a good example of how this is a guy who was in some people's top 100, like fell out of a lot of people's top 100, be in, in, in fairness, for somewhat justifiable reason. I, I personally didn't understand the falling out of the top 100. I think that was absurd for people to just be like, all right, yeah, he had a rough three months, so therefore he's out entirely of my top 100. You know, that was a little bit weird to me. 
but the reason he fell is because he had some control issues and he was giving up long balls in AAA. So there was reason. It looked like he kind of lost his confidence. And then in spring training, he looks great and everything, all simulated sort of stuff. We're getting all these great words about him. He's driving down Arcillo and 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 uh, Mark Grant to games and stuff like that. And he has been great. And he's clearly, clearly, I, I mean, I'm not, this isn't even a hot take. It's not. He is the National League Rookie of the Year currently. Uh, Seiya Suzuki has not been all that great. I think he was probably the front runner heading into the year, and he's been in and out of the lineup lately. His strikeout rate uh, rose. Only reason I'm talking about him is because that's like the second guy that people talk about. And for the most part, like maybe I'm missing someone. Maybe there is a Aaron Ashby. I f- he might be a rookie out of Milwaukee. I'm not entirely sure, but I can't really think of a lot of rookies, even in the American League too, that have had the impact that Mackenzie Gore has had so far for their team. And especially for this Padres team that, you know, desperately needs consistent starting pitching, especially with injuries to Blake Snell to start the year. And then Mike Clevenger to start the year. And then for Mike Clevenger to go on the aisle again, you really need that. You really need that. Right. And in this game, just for some other stuff, just some, to, to break it down a little bit further, he generated 15 whiffs, which is great uh, through his four seam fastball 58% of the time. But, and we know four seam fastball is great. Obviously, his, his velo touching 98 at points. He was really, really good there um, for sure. Nothing much to talk about with the velocity. That's been that was probably one of the big things that excited everybody heading into the season is when the velo jumped on pretty much all of his pitches and his, and the fastball too. I remember first hearing about Gore back in 2020. Uh, not first hearing about him, but when he was, you know, with the top ranked pitching prospect that he was like a 95, 96 guy. Now he's a 97, 98 guy. And that matters. It shows you that he's improving at his ripe old age of 23, right? Like he's been really, really good. But what I like the most in this outing is 25% of the time he threw curveballs, 14% of the time he threw sliders, increasing his pitch mix as things go on, actually generated six whiffs on the slider. And I don't care if it's the pirates. I've said this a lot about Gore. For a rookie pitcher that's had such a weird, tumultuous sort of arc uh, that he has, I don't really care what the competition is. Because bottom line is he has a 1.7 ERA. He's not giving up runs. And I know that, like, yes, his he looked amazing. He had 10 strikeouts against the Reds, and then he had six the week before, or something like that, right? Like, I know. I know that there was some competition things of, like, all right, it's easy to do that, but I don't care at this point. He's just been awesome, and those whiff numbers are showing it, and he's throwing more of his off-speed stuff, and that's what I love. The slider looks vicious at times. Curveball, I'm surprised. Maybe it's the amount of times they throw the fastball. The hitters are kind of not able to adjust at the, on the curveball. That sometimes hangs there, and I'm a little bit surprised that more hitters aren't able to take it deep, but it's because the fastball, he can locate it in the top right corner and top left corners of the plate so well. He gets a lot of called strikes there. He just whirls it in there. High fastballs is really where he seems to be really just kind of improving a lot uh, based on what we'd seen previously. And just kind of that's where he's his bread and butter is. So Gore's been awesome and you love to see it. You absolutely love to see it. Um, I've talked a lot about Gore so far, so let's move on to some other things. Uh, In this game, a home Profade. That's how I like saying his name. Profade. Uh, He hits a home run. I don't know why I say it like that. There's some players in baseball that I say their names differently for some reason. George Springer. I say Springer. I don't know why I say it like that with that accent. I just, just something I do. So Profade, he gets a home run in this game, two for four uh, with two ribbies, uh, two run shot from him. Uh, not much else from the hitting department. To be perfectly honest with you, Hassan Kim, one for four in this game. The first baseman uh, who must not be named one, or I'm sorry, 0 for three. Luke Voigt, one for four. We'll talk about him a little bit later. And then the hero of the game. One for three on the day, but that one hit was a lovely one. It was an extra innings. Trent Grisham hits a home run that goes off of the right field foul pole. And it was one of those hits because I'm I'm not going to lie to y'all. I was sitting next to my mom. We're like, oh, God, here's Grisham. You know, like, all right, he's trying to butt. All right, hopefully he can get the runner over. He's been terrible this year. I've talked about this on the show a lot. And then he hits it, and I don't even react. I just go. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just saying like, of course he did that, right? When I'm talking smack, he hits the walk-off home run. Uh, he needed that desperately. This is a guy that has not been hitting for power at all. He hasn't been hitting in general. The only good thing about his offense this year is that sometimes he can draw a walk or two, but he needed that desperately. Can that kickstart something? I doubt it at this point, at least personally, but still a win is a win and love it for him. Cause I don't dislike Trent Grisham. I just don't think he's very good. That's just me though. 
But before we continue on, guys, let me quickly talk to you about something that I do feel good about and I do believe in, ladies and gentlemen. Our next partner has a product I use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens. That's right. Because, you know, some personalized problems, I want to be a little bit more healthy, start off my day right. Some, you know, immune system sort of stuff that my doctor tells me about. You know, I got to monitor the cholesterol and whatever the heck, right? All those terms that I still don't quite always fully understand. That's why I have a doctor. Doctors are cool. But anyway, Athletic Greens, guys, they're really, really cool. With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things. They do all the things for you. All right? It's 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 really cool. I love that. And it's it's really really simple. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while tasting good. Uh, you know, it's I don't know what else to say, man. I mean, it's healthy for you. What do you want from me, guys? Check it out if you would like. I highly recommend it. It's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop and a cup of water every day. Simple as that, guys. And to make it easy, easier, even easier than that, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Remember, that is athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. How about them apples, right? Mm -mm -mm. let's continue talking everybody let's continue talking let's recap a little bit of the other things that happened this weekend right and let's start saturday game actually let's talk about saturday's game because saturday's game was a little bit depressing right and you know you guys know all right some people like to say i i, I hate this team and all i'm doing is being critical and i'm being negative or whatever the heck right that's fine that's fine i get that but Sometimes I like to just end on a positive note. So we're going to talk about the one loss the Padres suffered over this weekend. They lost 4-2 to the Pirates on Saturday, so the opposite of Sunday's score. Despite uh, Joe Musgrove having a pretty great start yet again, uh, six innings yet again in this game. He has not had uh, less than six innings in any of his starts this year, which is awesome. He goes six innings, giving up one earned run on six hits, two walks, and seven Ks. His ERA is currently sitting at 1.86, a whip under one as well. He was pretty good. Uh, he was pretty good in this game. Not the most dominant start, I think, of the season. I think against San Francisco, he was a little bit better. I think game the, the Miami game, he was pretty great. Bottom line is just the fact that you can count on this guy for a quality start does mean something. I know that quality start is a weird... Uh, that some people disagree with the validity of it in terms of how useful it is for judging pitchers. But bottom line is for a Padres team that's had trouble scoring runs and a Padres team that has had a lot of bullpen blowups uh, scattered throughout the season. Very nice to know that you just have that consistent six to seven inning guy basically every single time. Uh, and he has great control. I, you guys know about Joe Musgrove, right? And I'm going to be doing more of an episode focused solely on Joe Musgrove, hopefully later this week when I finish writing my article for Just Baseball, which I, I intended to get done last week, but I messed up. I, I, I biffed it just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. But uh, hopefully we're going to do that this week. Uh, Musgrove was great, but unfortunately, like I said, they aren't able to win the game. Uh, this one is on the offense, though. Um, this one's on the offense. In this game, we get multiple strikeouts from Luke Voigt. Uh, he was intentionally walked at one point and got a hit, but he struck out twice. Got some strikeouts from Will Myers. Or, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Oh, I was looking at the wrong person. Okay, sorry. Luke Voigt actually had two walks. My apologies. One for three in the game, an intentional walk as well. Will Myers is the one who struck out twice that I'm looking at, even though he get, did get two hits. And then the Padres first baseman, who I might as well talk about a little bit right now, uh, goes 0-4. Does he go 0-4? No, he goes one for five with a double, but also three Ks on the night. He's still sitting at a 327 batting average so far and a 391 on base, which is very good. 457 slugging, which is fine too. And if you look at his split stats, I mean... He's still he's still been really good against lefties this year, which I think is a big improvement for him, right? 373, 418 uh, batting average on base against them this year in 51 at-bats. That's been a big improvement for him. So I think that's part of why he's been so solid. Um, and he's had a little bit of a slow May, 
right? 278, 337 on base. It's not the worst in the world. It's still not good when you consider that he's a first baseman that they signed to be kind of an all-star caliber player and the contract and all that, but it's not awful. He's not hitting for many extra bases, uh, extra base hits, I should say, this month. Walk rate a little bit down, striking out a tad bit more. Um, but uh, bottom line, he hasn't been like an absolute atrocious sort of player this year uh, by any stretch. So even though I'm not going to get rid of my rule about saying his name on this podcast. It's, it's fine. I know he's in a little bit of a slump, but we expected this as I talked about in that Jay Jaffe piece from fan graphs that most people with his ground ball to fly ball rate, it does not keep up literally ever, especially when you take into account that he doesn't have a lot of speed. So yes, he's hitting better off lefties. Yes. He's putting the ball in play. He's making good contact, but bottom line is still can't expect too much from the guy to at least carry the offense. He's been okay though. But enough about him. Uh, Jay Cronenworth, one for five in this game. Got to talk about him a little bit. Um, yeah, so Jay Cronenworth, the th- here's, here's how I'm going to talk about it. The Padres offense this year, I've talked a lot about Hassan Kim and Jerickson Profar. And you might be saying, well, Javi, they aren't necessarily all-star super hitters either. You know, they haven't been all that incredible offensively either. I mean, Profar went into a slump for like two weeks at one point, and he didn't say a word. And Hassan Kim... He's not hitting for a lot of power anymore. He's been very just singles and pulling the ball, and he hasn't looked great either. Yes, but the way I view it about those guys is they just have to be two war players. If you could give us a two war season where, in the case of Profar, he's hit a lot more home runs this year than last year already. But with him, it's pretty good left field. It's certainly better than Tommy Pham, who, by the way, yes, everybody, I saw the story over the weekend. I don't know. I will say with Tommy Pham, I did get bad vibes with him last year with the collision with Hassan Kim, not because he messed up or Kim messed up and that they collided. It happens, right? And, and hopefully, and thankfully, they were both okay. Kim throws the ball in and then goes back to the floor in pain, back to the grass in pain, I should say. What I didn't like was Fam looking so upset, and then in the dugout, like getting into an altercation that he had to be held back. Like that's a weird reaction to have when you and your teammate just got hurt, potentially. Um, I didn't get that. And I'm not going to start making assumptions about anger problems and all that stuff, but it was a, a little bit of a red flag for me. It's not like he was like, oh my God, or maybe even talking to Kim or talking to people being like, hey, we got to coordinate that better. Instead, it was just a lot of like rage pent up, it looked like. So anyway, yes, that that video, that story about Tommy fans slapping Jack Peterson over a fantasy football trade or not even a trade, but a, a move in their fantasy league and then getting suspended three games. Yeah, I saw it. It was wild. Um, but with Hassan Kim, to get back to the point, for him, I was just hoping that he could become an average MLB uh, batter and then play really great defense. That's the thing. They're role players. Profar and Kim play good defense and then be at least, you know, 100 WRC plus, maybe a little bit higher than that, like 105 WRC plus players. That's okay. That's all I really needed from them. Will Myers, on the other hand, same sort of thing. If he can just be okay, then it's fine, especially since he's probably gone after this year. The Padres' first baseman, he he came through. I have to admit, he's looking like a guy that might just be at least not a total liability. The big problem this year has been Trent Grisham and Jake Cronenworth. Jake Cronenworth is whiffing at more pitches, it seems, and he's just not making good contact. He's hitting a lot of fly balls that it, it's it feels like he's trying. It looks like he's pressing a little bit. The only thing with him, I mean, let me pull up his savant page really quickly. I should probably do that, right? Uh, Cronenworth on the year. Every time it seems like he might get it rolling. Remember, he had that home run a few weeks ago that we got excited about. He's still not, he's still, I was wrong about that. He's still not whiffing a whole lot, but he is striking out um, a decent amount more. He's not hitting the ball particularly hard. In terms of his speed, in terms of his chase rate and of his whiff rate, he's been fine. It's just that the contact itself is not there. And he's never been a guy who's going to hit the ball particularly super hard. But it's just not falling. He's hitting. He hit two fly balls. I think three pop ups actually in Sunday's game, and he just he just doesn't look right. He's played a good glove. That's nice. He made one play earlier this uh, like a week or so ago that was incredible. But for the most part, he has been really really messed up. Uh, He has not been good this year. And then Grisham, I've talked about a lot. Basically, uh, among qualified batters in the outfield, he's been the second worst next to Cody Bellinger. And Cody Bellinger at least has shown that he can hit for some power every now and then, even if he strikes out way too much. And he also plays good defense. Grisham, he plays okay defense, but his value isn't being supported enough by only that. 
So for me, those are the two things with the Padres offense. It's Trent Grisham and it's Jake Cronenworth. Trent Grisham, we were hoping, I'm not going to say expecting. I was I was very uh, skeptical of Grisham heading into the year, but with Grisham, we were hoping this is the guy that's going to have that bounce back year to help lift the offense while Tatis is gone. And Cronenworth, we just kind of assumed. And those two guys are probably the biggest disappointments for the Padres so far. And don't get me wrong, Luke Voigt hasn't been great either, but you know he was a a flyer trade candidate, and even still, he's hitting better than guys like Cronenworth and and Grisham in a lot of ways. And we'll talk about him in just one second, guys. Actually, um, because he had quite the the Friday heroics, I guess you could say. I guess you could say, ladies and gentlemen. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So let's talk about it. Friday's game, guys. The Padres won as well. Um, and oh wait. One more thing, my apologies, guys, just to mention, and I, I'm only going to mention this quickly, Taylor Rogers does get charged with the loss and the blown save uh, in this one. One inning, three earned runs on two hits, a uh, walk and three Ks. Don't care, he was due. In a 2-1 game, this guy had a 0.44 ERA heading into the game. Padres offense needs to score more. Taylor Rogers is very good, very good, but I don't. I'm not believing that this guy is Raleigh Fingers or he's Mariano Rivera or he's... Heck, that one year of Blake Trinan or even a couple years with Kirby Yates or something like that. Like you can't count on a guy to consistently win one run games and save them for you in the bottom of the ninth inning. So, or the top of the ninth, whatever, right? That's the big uh, sort of thing here. So no concerns there. He was due. Moving on to Friday's game. The Padres win this one four to three, which was awesome. Uh, what can I say? Uh, in this game, starting pitcher is Mr. Sean Manaya, who... Yeah, he's still got a 4.02 ERA, which is a little bit, uh, it doesn't feel that bad, right? But it is inflated by the fact that he did get a little bit lit up by the Dodgers. But And then also the game against San Francisco when he gave up four. Um, he's been very, he seems to give up a lot of his runs at the beginning of the game, uh, where guys just kind of take him deep a little bit. Uh, in this game, the runs that he ends up giving up, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Uh, top of the first inning, a home run to Mr. Brian Reynolds, who... Uh -oh. Excuse me. Wow. Uh, who has not been very good this year for the Pirates. So you could chalk that one up to just him being due. 376 feet to left field. And then Diego Castillo ends up getting a double in the top of the fourth inning, making it 3-0, uh, which was unfortunate. But Manaya again, the key here is to mention that he is capable of those unbelievable starts. I actually think he's due for a really good start. I think he's going to have one uh, probably against the Brewers this coming week. Is it the Brewers? Yeah, it'll be the Brewers in this coming week. I think he's going to have a pretty good start. Um, or maybe, is it the Cardinals, actually? He might actually be playing the Cardinals. I am I keep forgetting what the heck our rotation is, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> I keep forgetting what the heck the Padres rotation is. But either way, I think he's due for a good start, but he can get hit hard sometimes when the strikeout stuff isn't working, when the sinker's hanging a little bit. It's fine. It happens. And Manaya, bottom line, I'm going to keep saying this every time he has a a, a less than ideal start. I'm going to say it every single time. If he's your four or five, you're doing great. And he's probably the fourth best pitcher on the Padres right now. I think maybe Darvish has been a little bit better. Gore has been better. Musgrove has been better. So yeah, like fourth, something like that, you know, depending, but opinions varying, I should say. Uh, and if that's your gut, then that's just, you're in really great shape, right? You're in really great shape if that's the situation you're in. Uh, but for the Padres, the big hit comes in the bottom of the sixth inning when I was about to fall asleep because it was a late game for me. It started at 10 on Friday, and I was very, very tired. A three-run bomb from Luke Voigt allowing Profar and the Padres' first baseman to score, which was lovely. Padres' first baseman in this game, by the way, he goes two for three with a walk, so he had a pretty good game as well. Um, even if he hasn't been driving in, runs he's still been getting on base and getting hits even if at a lower clip so it's it almost doesn't feel like he's been playing uh better lately you know what i mean he's been he's been okay lately but anyway uh love that from voight he's been due for some power he's been disappointing from the power perspective not necessarily from the walk perspective i know he kind of you know is kind of somewhat back just got back to the lineup um but for sure he does have power potential uh, if you look at isolated power, he's been up there for years. This isn't a guy who was hitting to the short porch only uh, for the Yankees, right? Or only hitting against the Orioles pitching back when he was with the Yankees, right? So uh, with Luke Voigt, hopefully he can improve as time goes on. I like that he doesn't swing at total nonsense all the time. He does strike out, but doesn't seem to chase the worst pitches in the world. He's just trying to find his, his groove, hopefully. 
And hopefully he does continue to do that. Uh, Manny Machado in this game, yeah, he goes 0 for 2, but he drew two walks, which was nice. A very calm weekend for Manny because he sat out the last two games of the series. Doesn't seem like it's a big deal in terms of injuries, which is good news. I mean, saving news, right? Uh, absolutely saving news. Um, Manny Machado, the Padres offense, and I tweeted this yesterday. The Padres offense, if not for Manny Machado, would be in really bad shape if you just look at the fact that they're their average is 21st in the league heading into Sunday, 233. Their OPS is 669 as a team, which is 22nd in Major League Baseball. They have 33 home runs, now 34, uh, after the Trent Grisham thing. But heading into Sunday, that was 27th best in the league. And then they have a 95 WRC+, plus, which is the 20th best in the league. Just a quick refresher, WRC+, plus, just kind of a really good batting offensive stat that kind of shows you if it's 100, then that's about league average. And then if you have a 95, that's 5% worse than league, than kind of the average as a, as a bet, right? Uh, it doesn't take into account the defense and whatnot. It takes into account, you know, uh, just ballpark factors and fielding factors and kind of is a really good stat to just show you how just as a batter, pure, remove everything else, how have they been? And the Padres offense has not been very good. So imagine where those ranks would be if not for Manny Machado is basically what I'm saying. It would basically be, uh, a couple hits from the first baseman every now and then and like no slugging and just poor RBI uh, numbers overall. So that's kind of where the Padres are sitting. And that's why Manny Machado is the MVP of the National League so far, as far as I'm concerned. And you can bring up just OPS. You can bring up batting average. You can bring up war when you take into account his defense as well. But I know some people might say, oh, well, look at. Uh, Mookie Betts, who's been on fire lately, by the way, he has like 14 home runs. Uh, for me, this is kind of like a Golden State Warriors situation when they had Kevin Durant. I don't care how well those dudes are playing. Stop. You guys, your team is stacked. I refuse to believe that you're the most valuable player. I, I'm i sorry. I'm sorry. Like, it's just me. Maybe it's just me. I just refuse. You know what I mean? Like, I, I need to take into account that the Padres desperately needed Machado to be a superstar uh, for them to win. Um, And then, you know, he came through. Uh, The Dodgers, if Mookie Betts was just eh, would it really hurt them that much to the point where they're like, oh, my God? No, it wouldn't. So that's just me. But, yeah, I mean, that's basically the weekend. The Padres offense was really up and down uh, in a lot of ways. They had some big RBIs, obviously, from Vote Voigt and Profar and Trent Grisham to end it. And then they had to St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis is a pretty good team. I think that they're they kind of get a little bit inflated by the fact that they don't have to worry about their division with the Cubs, the Pirates, and the lowly, lowly Cincinnati Reds. They basically just have the Brewers to contend with in terms of their division. So I think they can sometimes get a little bit uh, overrated, but still a really solid team. That's going to be a fun series to watch for sure with those great gold glovers. And I know, I know all you Padres fans, your favorite player, Nolan Arenado, uh, who you guys just adore and you love giving him credit and you love, you 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 just can't get enough of him winning awards over Manny Machado. <laughs> I have to admit, the winning player of the month last last month, that was, I didn't get that. Like, I, he was great, don't get me wrong, but I was like, Machado, like, why did he win that last week? That Like, yeah, I'm making fun of a little bit of the Padres fans who freak out about Arenado sometimes, but last month, yeah, absolutely all at a point. I didn't get that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't get, especially when you take into account all these things about Tatis being gone, the offense being carried by him. It's like, really? Why did he? That's odd. Whatever. He has been a stud, though. And I imagine we're going to talk about him and the rest of the Cardinals on tomorrow's show. I'm doing a crossover with the host of Locked On Cardinals, my good buddy, Lucas Smith. That should be a very, very fun episode. Love talking with Lucas. Such a pleasant fellow. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. And then the rest of the week, going to be recapping games. You guys know how I do. Hopefully, we'll talk a little bit about Musgrove and his potential extension and whether or not the Padres can pay him, all sorts of things, and just uh, vibing well. And I hope you guys are vibing well on this lovely Memorial Day uh, day. And this past weekend, I was rocking. If you saw me on YouTube, you saw me rocking my blue palm tree shirt in celebration of another series win, guys. Uh, and I hope you're all uh, looking forward to the next bunch of series. And hopefully the Padres keep on winning. But with that all being said, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres. 
for all your your live tweeting needs over at Lockdown Padres. Uh, and then out have a I don't know. I'm probably going to tweet about Stranger Things soon. Love the first episode. Really did. Just even if I think it should have ended after season three, like a lot, I think it clearly should have ended after season three, just based on how it was framed and how dramatic it was. I love season three. Um, I still can't get enough of these damn kids. Like, I'm not going to lie. At least at the minimum, the performances will be great. And I'll like the kids and all the other characters and the acting at minimum. So we'll see how that all pans out. And until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies. Take care. You are locked.